this was the most unusual as well as nerve wracking election in my lifetime. Um, it was unusual for a whole host of reasons, not the least being the COVID pandemic um, and, and what the implications were, which I'll get back to later. Um, and so well, let's unpack this a little bit. So one thing I think we have to identify is that th this election and the significant numbers of people that voted for Trump, despite the Biden victory, represents a long-term anti-democratic trend in recent US politics that brings together two tendencies. One is what I would call neoliberal authoritarianism, and the other is right-wing populism. And I'll go into that in a second. But first, it's, it's also important that we're clear that the United States has always been a flawed democratic capitalist state. These flaws are the result of a legacy of settler colonialism, racial slavery, forced labor, and annexationism. And these systems uh, skewed the development or attempted the development of a democracy. Efforts at consistent democracy have been regularly undermined by various realities uh, related to that. So, for example, the uh, efforts to annihilate the First Nations, the Reconstruction after the Civil War, and the terrorist activity that was used to uh, undermine those uh, administrations in the South. The, the populist movement in the late 1800s that looked like it was moving and advancing democracy was undermined by uh, white supremacy and particularly the development of Jim Crow, but also by active terrorist activity. And I wanna call your attention to the 1898 coup in Wilmington, North Carolina, in which a progressive populist white and black administration democratically elected was overthrown by an armed uprising of white supremacists. Uh, there was also in the 1930s, efforts towards a coup d'etat against Franklin Roosevelt uh, that was carried out by various corporatists. And they attempted uh, in enlisting a Marine Corps general named Smedley Butler to develop a pro-fascist army. Uh, Butler did, uh, decided not to go along with this and the uh, effort under, was undermined. So there have been these various efforts at democracy that are frequently undermined uh, by these extreme right-wing tendencies. What's different about this moment is that there are challenges to the legitimacy of the state that are coming from the right wing and an attempt at the same time to overturn the victories of the 20th century. I, I just call it overthrowing the 20th century. Okay, so what were these long-term trends that I mentioned, right-wing populism and neoliberal authoritarianism? So neoliberal authoritarianism refers to a phenomena that we started to see in evidence in the 1970s in the so-called advanced capitalist countries. And it was a, uh, a, a, a compression of space in the political and cultural realms, whereby uh, the, there was the accumulation, further accumulation of wealth at the top, and a restriction on the ability to exercise real democracy uh, from below. This took place in a number of different ways, including the uh, militarization of societies and particularly their police forces around the world, the use of anti-terrorism statutes as a way of locking up political dissidents. Uh, we saw in the realm of the media, a shrinking space for uh, different points of view so much so that you could have this unusual situation where someone like Bill Clinton was described as a leftist, uh, when in fact his domestic policies were to the right of Richard Nixon's. So you could see this compression that was going on and a greater and greater authority going to the executive branch of government, not just in the United States, but uh, throughout the capitalist world. Um, so that's a sort of reference to neoliberal authoritarianism that, that I think that we've been seeing. Part of that 
I would argue, is a sort of preemptive assault against popular movements because of the impact of the shift of the economy and the environmental crisis and the anticipation of the possibility of, of various kinds of responses and insurrections. The other trend, the other authoritarian trend, is right-wing populism. And I think it's important to understand that right-wing populism, as I love to say, is the herpes of capitalism. It exists in all capitalist societies. It emerges time and again when a capitalist society is in uh, disarray, and usually economic disarray. It has different manifestations in various uh, capitalist societies. And in the United States, it, um, I would say in that it, the characteristic you could describe it as neo-Confederate, in a sense that it's, in, to a great extent, ex inspired by the example of the Confederate States of America, although one could argue that the roots go further back. Um, Right-wing populism is a countercurrent to progressive change. It is a movement in response to progressive change that, is sent, uh, that attempts to block that and carry out a radical, reconstruction of society, the most radical element within right-wing populism are fascists, uh, but the entire movement is not necessarily fascist. It is irrationalist. We'll talk about that more later. It's racist. It's sexist. Um, it's uh, homophobic. It's xenophobic. Uh, it's authoritarian in its uh, structure and content. Um, and frequently, it's, uh, it, it, it bases its view on myths about the past. So in the case of the United States, the critical image for right-wing populism are the 1950s. And the, the idea that the 1950s was the pinnacle in the development of US society, but it's linked to a notion that fundamentally the United States is or should be a white republic. Um, right-wing populism is, um, it, 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 as a political movement, it's not exactly an ideology. It's a certain framework. And it's a framework that argues that there are the people who are defined usually in terms of uh, ethnically, racially, religiously, versus an elite, which is also defined racially, ethnically, uh, and, and religiously. So in the United States context, the elite are frequently Jews, uh, they're described as uh, Jews or um, other non-WASP uh, populations. And, and so the idea is that the United States, in the minds of the right-wing populace, was a country that was created for a certain brand of white people. That's really what it, it, it comes down to. And it is, it's become a very large and significant movement, and it has an armed wing. Uh, and so we're not just talking about exchanging harsh language. We're talking about people that are quite content to promote the idea of the need for a new civil war, up to and including the possible extermination of various populations in this country. Now, this did not come out of nowhere, the rise of this movement. You, in addition to the fact that you could say, you could see the elements in the 19th century and early 20th century with the KKK and other groups, in the aftermath of the 1964 presidential election and the defeat of Barry Goldwater, there was a reorganization among some elements of the right, led by people like Richard Vigory and Paul Weyrich. And these individuals went through a whole strategic analysis of how to overturn the 20th century, in effect. They first were thinking about uh, creating an independent party or joining with George Wallace in the formation of an independent party. They ultimately decided to penetrate the Republican Party and to move the Republican Party systematically to the right, to, in fact, what it's become now, a hard right-wing party. Um, critical to that was the issue of race and the use of race as a uh, button to shift white people and to create a white bloc for uh, a political transformation. So you could see this happening over time, slowly but surely. 1968, Nixon and his Southern strategy. 
which was really the white people's strategy. And it was a strategy to in further encourage the political realignment such that white people started moving in greater numbers to the Republican Party and the Republican Party could position itself as being the non-black party. That's effectively what they set out to be. Um, so the Southern strategy, uh, you could see it further in the uh, Reagan campaign starting in Philadelphia, Mississippi, not more than a few miles from the place where several civil rights uh, workers had been murdered. But the other thing about Reagan was the other kinds of symbolism, like the welfare queen, and the fact that the welfare queen was identified as a black, right? Um, and irrespective of the demographics of who was on welfare at the time, you, you saw that was, that was among uh, the, the various buttons. In the George Herbert Walker Bush campaign, we saw the Willie Horton incident, which was used very effectively by the Bush campaign as a way of hitting the race button, particularly when it wasn't always clear that Bush was a shoo-in for uh, re-election. Um, we've seen this button hit time and again. Uh, we saw it in the Gingrich's contract with America, what some of us call the contract on America. But the racial undertone of the contract with America, again, making the argument that this country had been stolen from the people whose land it really should be. And, and, and they weren't talking about Native Americans. They were talking about this land as being a land not for you and me, but for whites and whites alone. So we saw this, we saw this uh, process building and building and, these, and the Republican establishment was quite content to utilize the racial button to stir up the masses. And much like Dr. Frankenstein and the monster, Dr. Frankenstein created the monster assuming that he could control the monster. The monster had other ideas. For the Republican establishment, they saw themselves, they, they were playing with this right-wing populist movement, never believing that this movement would actually at some point get out of control. And slowly but surely, it did. And we saw that uh, up close during the Obama administration with the rise of the Tea Party and, and other events. And yet, despite the way that this movement, the right-wing populist movement was, uh, was um, evolving, the Republican establishment decided in effect it couldn't control. And so to a great extent, it was gonna get behind this movement. Now, why do I lay all this out? One is that we have to be clear, people have started using this term Trumpism. I don't think that there is such a thing. There's something called right-wing populism. And Trump happens to be the character who is representing that now. My wife has a metaphor that I thought was perfect. Trump is the rattler on the tail of the rattlesnake. He is the noise that's being created by the snake. But he is not the snake. The snake has been with us for a while. The snake has put its fangs into the body politic and inserted the poison into the system. Trump is the one that is rattling and making that noise. And in making that noise, he has made it legitimate for other people to make a similar noise. And that's what I think we have to understand because when Trump moves on in whatever form, whether he retires, whatever, it's not like the movement will disappear, not because of Trump himself, but because the roots of this right wing populism, populist movement are very much in the system itself and will have to be extracted. And that becomes a central task of the progressive movement that we have to understand this right wing populist movement is not going away. We're gonna to have to take it on in, in various fashions. All right, so what does this mean then about the 2020 election and how to look at that? All right, well, first, Biden won. And, and this is really important because there's a tendency that's already started to discount the significance of Biden's victory. Biden's victory was greater in terms of the popular vote than Hillary Clinton's victory of the popular vote over uh, Trump in 2016. 
of the, as of now, it looks like the electoral college votes that Biden has at least matched those that Trump had in 2016. And at that point, as you may remember, Trump declared that it was a landslide victory on his part, despite not having the popular vote. But in this case, Biden has a popular vote and the electoral vote. And it was a very significant united front that was created. And one of the things that we progressives are going to have to ask ourselves is a hard question. Was Biden the only person that could have put it together? And I know before the election, many of us said, no, Bernie Sanders would take this. And frankly, I'm not sure anymore that that was the case. And particularly looking at the way that the election played out. Um, Biden's victory was very, very important as a repudiation of Trump. But it did not work itself uh, down, uh, down ballot in the way that the Democrats had been expecting. But beyond the Biden victory, what else can we make of the 2020 election? I would say that there's three factors that are critical, race, revanchism, and a right-wing rejection of reality. And I want to triple underline those three features. One, in terms of race, Trump has made his life and political existence shaped by race, whether it was his uh, attack on the Central Park Five, and his insistence on the death penalty for them, whether it was his announcement in 2015 of running for election and, and describing Mexicans as the purveyors of crime and rape and, 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 and other things, uh, whether it was his attack on Muslims. One of the things that Trump has been very, very clear about is the use of race as a way of describing who he believes is the legitimate population not just in the United States, but on the world. His reference to the shithole countries tells you a great deal about how he has looked um, at, at the rest of the world. So race was very important as a motivating factor. In, the, in, in early in 2020, when he was going after so-called suburban white women voters, remember what he was talking about when he was saying that he was standing there against the danger of low-income housing coming into the suburbs. I mean, like, wake up. Do you think that that had anything other than the race to do? I mean, just let's be real and understand what he was trying to do. He was playing the race card. But the other thing that happened in terms of race in 2020 was, of course, the response to the George Floyd murder, in which we had protests around the country, um, some insurrections, but mainly peaceful protests that took place and it had an energizing effect, particularly on the African-American and the youth vote, so that many people who had sat out 2016 uh, turned out to vote. So, but, but here's the irony. In addition to inspiring progressives to come out to vote, it did something equivalent to what we saw in 1968, which Nixon played off of. Nixon played off of the civil disorder that the country was going through in 67 and 68 to, to talk about law and order and stabilization. And he was able to use that to ride into the White House. That was part of what Trump was trying to do in 2020 by talking about the, the instability, the alleged uh, socialist movement out there, I wish it had been, um, the, the, uh, the alleged insurrection, Antifa, et cetera, and completely denying the serious danger of right-wing terrorism. He was playing to that. And so the, the issue of race became very important in terms of motivating both electorates. The second thing, revanchism. In the United States, we don't use that term very much. It's a term most regularly associated with Germany uh, after World War I and after World War II. Revanchism is a set of politics that's based on revenge and the idea of a specific kind of revenge. It's getting back with what was allegedly taken from you. And what right-wing populists and Trump uh, elaborated is the idea that the American dream was taken from the average white person. That once upon a time, if you were a good, hardworking white person, that if you worked hard, the life of your child would be better than your life. And 
by the mid 1970s, that started to change for most working people. The question was who was behind that? For right wing populists and Trump in particular, it wasn't that there was a system behind it. There were different demographic groups that were behind that, whether it was Jews, Blacks, Asians, Latinos, whatever. There were these different ethnic groups, ethnic groups be, uh, and religious groups and genders that were behind this. And those were the ones that we had to take things back from. And, and so revanchism, very, very important, also when it, specifically when it came to gender. Because despite, it, it wasn't just that Trump is a misogynist, it's that the politics that he was elaborating were ones of looking again back to the 1950s, not just in terms of race, but also in terms of gender. Just think about his references in the, in the final weeks before the election, when he was saying that he needed more white suburban women to vote for him, and he was describing white suburban women that don't exist anymore. He was, discussed, he was describing June Cleaver, right? He was describing Donna Reed. He was describing characters in fact, caricatures from the 1950s. So this revanchism challenges gender roles. It challenges the advances of the women's movement, challenges the advancement of the uh, uh, LBTQ movement, et cetera. Right? Um, the final one is the rejection of reality. And this is probably going to be one of the hardest things for many of us, many of us to accept, which is that 72 million people were prepared to vote for somebody who denied the seriousness, publicly denied, the seriousness of the COVID-19 crisis. That he displayed complete incompetence and a cavalier attitude to nearly 250,000 people dying and millions of people getting sick. And instead paraded around with no mask, no social distancing, and, and creating a culture around him in the White House of people that refuse to wear masks, creating a culture in his demonstrations of people that were openly denying something. It was this revolt against science, but it didn't stop there. It was this rejection of reality of the uh, environmental catastrophe and climate change. So it's this rejection of science, this rejection of, of, uh, of um, you know, our, our, uh, of, of reality, it was as if there had been a mass recruitment by the Flat Earth Society. And so you have the situation of a rejection of reality. And, and you see that continuing in the aftermath of the election, where you have masses of people that argue in alignment with Trump that the election was stolen despite no evidence, no evidence. And What's worse, they don't feel that they need to assert evidence. It is simply that he lost. That means that it had to have been stolen. Well, what else about the 2020 election? Well, there was no democratic wave. And why is that? Well, no one quite knows. And I think we have to be very careful in drawing conclusions, in part because this was a very unusual election. It was an election in the middle of a plague. And this has never happened in our lifetime in the United States. And one of the things about the pandemic is that it undermined, derailed the ground strategy of the Democrats for months. That most of the plans had in, involved door-to-door -door work, uh, it involved uh, uh, rallies, et cetera, that came to a very abrupt halt. Now with the Republicans, it was much more uneven in part because of their level of denial. And it was only in late summer, in part inspired by Unite Here, I would argue, and in some other unions, that there was a renewed effort at on the ground, or real ground game. Uh, and Unite Here, which deserves an immense amount of credit, demonstrated that the ground game could be carried out in, in fact, a very safe way. But it, it may have been too late uh, in some places, particularly in Florida. There were also mistakes in that the... Um, the Democratic Party, for reasons that defy explanation, failed to put the resources into the Latino, Latina voter. And I say voter as opposed to vote, because one lesson that we've learned from this election is that there is no Latino, Latina vote. 
there are Latino Latina voters, that it's a very dis, uh, um, diverse group, just as Asians, you can't put them all in one category and look at it as a voting block. And, uh, but that said, insufficient resources were put in, that may have been a contributing factor. Another thing that may have been a contributing factor is that the success of the Biden coalition effort of building a united front against the insanity of the Trump administration um, may have been successful at the top, but it may not have been enough to move down ballot candidacies. In other words, uh, what it appears is that there were many people that voted for Biden, but then went on to vote for Republicans down ballot. And part of that is this very strange U.S. thinking about splitting the vote in, as a way of um, in, in guaranteeing that there's no extremism or something. But part of it may have been that there were people that would have otherwise voted for Trump, but just simply decided, this guy's nuts, and I'm not just, uh, we're not going to go for it, but we want to continue to vote down ballot. Now, this then points to a, a significant weakness, I would argue, in what the Democratic uh, Party's theory was, which was that what they needed for those down ballot elections was a stronger populist, progressive, anti-racist program that the candidates, uh, and, and you could see that the, can, can, the, the progressive candidates by and large won, uh, contrary to what some of the centrists have argued but you needed across the board a stronger message about the kind of country we're trying to bring about, that it was not simply enough to say, we want Trump out. That, and, and many people have been saying this before November 3rd, that, that it needed to be a clearer message as to, yes, Trump is out, but then what do we bring back? You know, is it, is it a return to some idea of normality or is it something dramatically different? So while, Biden was able to get past the post. That wasn't enough, uh, apparently, for the Democrats. But again, I think we have to be careful because we don't know what might have happened had there not been this pandemic, one way or the other. And there are some people right now in the Republican Party that are crowing that the midterm elections will be a slam dunk for the Republicans. Um, I would say I don't think they should count the chickens just yet. And I also don't think the rest of us should worry about it. Um, what do we say about the current environment? Well, there's a few things. One is that I've been using a term I picked up uh, a while ago, and I think it describes our environment. It's called, it's a cold civil war uh, that we're in, in which we have a very polarized country. Now, again, this is not new. The United States has been polarized a lot. If you look at the 1960 election, for example, you saw that Kennedy beat Nixon by less than maybe 1% of the popular vote. And, and so, so the United States has been divided before, but there's an intensity to the division now, and particularly when you introduce the armed wing of the right-wing populace that make this particularly dangerous. We have incredible voter suppression that has been underway and really, after Obama was elected in 2008, an active Republican strategy to move voter suppression in state after state and to create this myth of voter fraud that took on a life of its own, particularly when it became racialized. Uh, and the Republicans were uh, very successful in moving that. Currently, they are, uh, they are moving an obstructionist program and there is a coup-like environment. Now, whether there will be a coup or not is anyone's guess, but there's a coup-like environment with uh, Trump continuing to assert that uh, he won the election, uh, failing to recognize Biden as the president-elect, having all of his minions repeat the same thing, and having many Republicans out in the field say the same nonsense. Where it will go, it's not clear, which is related to the third point, is an active effort to delegitimize Biden through magic. And by that, I mean that the effort by uh, the Republicans is to, to so taint the uh, Biden uh, administration and, and, and the victory, to raise so many questions about it without 
one word of uh, proof, one ounce of proof, but nevertheless, to create a situation where uh, there is a question for the next four years as to whether it was a legitimate uh, victory. Now, on the other side of the aisle, we have seen incredible progressive mass organizing and resistance. Uh, and, and there's been wonderful work that's gone on in Arizona, in Virginia, in a number of states uh, that has been done independent of the Democratic Party, but largely in support of Democratic candidates and, and often with ballot initiatives. This has been very, very important. The one uh, weakness in this work is that up until the very beginning of September, there was a high level of denial in progressive and liberal circles of the possibility of a coup, the possibility that Trump might hang on and therefore a lack of planning about what to do. All of a sudden, sometime around September 1st, it was like there was a lightning strike and people started to wake up. Uh, we should have been planning much, much earlier. Uh, a, a second thing in the plus column is that there appear to be some splits among Republicans. I'm not talking about the Lincoln Project. And it's hard to evaluate how significant the Lincoln Project was, but uh, they made some damn good ads. But, the, but there seem to be a growing number of Republicans that are uh, acknowledging that Biden is the, uh, the president-elect. There, uh, the third thing is that to, to note is that there will be challenges for Biden, and then there will be challenges for progressives vis-a-vis Biden. The challenges for Biden, if, he do, if the Democrats don't capture the Senate, McConnell will try to continue, he'll try to strangle Biden. And there will be, there are already all these efforts that are way, way off about reaching across the aisle on the part of Biden, and, and trying to be the adult in the room, much like they said to Obama in 2008, 2009, when it's completely the wrong message, when audacity needs to be the message. Uh, and and uh, Biden needs to be moving uh, very quickly. And that goes to part of what our task needs to be as progressives, which is to push the Biden administration incoming to do this, to take the steps that it needs to take against the right wing, to move, to reverse these disasters of the last four years and to advance a program, even if the votes don't exist in the Senate. He needs to be in permanent campaign mode, much like Trump was for the last four years. Um, final, uh, a final set of points. So what, do, what else do we need to do? Well, one is, as um, I said in 2008, a lot of people laughed. I said, uh, when people asked, should there be a uh, honeymoon period for Obama? I said, yes. He said, how long? I said, 24 hours. And people thought I was joking. I wasn't. Um, and I think what we have to understand now is that there is no honeymoon period for uh, Biden. There can't be. We need to be standing behind here, him knows length uh, so that there's nowhere for him to turn, no way for him to retreat. We have to be there and we have to push them as hard as possible to do what needs to happen. Second thing is that we're in a battle for democracy, both to preserve what we have, but also to expand what we have. And that's uh, uh, a third thing. The third thing is that the broad front that was used to defeat Trump is still needed. As I said before, the right-wing populist movement is not going away, and particularly when you recognize this armed wing, you've got to understand that even though we're going to have to be in a struggle with Biden, no question about that, the enemy, the right-wing populists, really do seek our annihilation, and we have to be prepared to stand um, against them. We need to be, uh, uh, we also need to have, as progressives, a comprehensive electoral strategy. And that means not waiting every four years for a presidential race. And it also means doing more than making financial contributions to candidates. We need to be building more electoral organizations, <clears throat> organizations like the Working Families Party, like California Calls, like the New Virginia Majority, like the New Florida Majority, 
and others. We need to be building these organizations um, that work, will work inside and outside of the Democratic Party to advance a pro-working people progressive agenda. We can't wait for the Democrats to do the right thing. We've got to force them to do it. And that means we have to take the lead. And it means that, uh, for example, the decision the Democratic Socialists of America made in 2019 when they said Bernie or bust was a terrible decision. Terrible. That that's not an electoral strategy. That's a statement that you can't make an electoral strategy based around one candidate. We have to have a more comprehensive one that includes how do we take over state after state after state after state, not just who do we back in an election for president, hoping that they'll do the right thing or doing it so that we can increase the number of members of our organization or doing it so that we can raise our flag. No, we've got to be in a fight for power. Um, and that's the only fight that is of, of, of any real significance. We need a revitalized labor movement. I was talking to a friend of mine, a uh, former leader of a major union earlier today, who was saying, Bill, when you look at the electoral map and you see these states that are turning blue, purple and blue, that's where the labor movement needs to be and needs to be organizing, and not just electoral organizing. We need to be having organizing campaigns. When you look at what's happening in Georgia, what is the labor movement's strategy for Georgia? What is it thinking about doing? When you look at the potential in Texas, yes, they, the Democrats were off about flipping Texas in this round. I thought Texas was going to flip also. I think it's going to at least flip the next time. Texas is in play. <clears throat> Therefore, what does the labor movement do in terms of organizing workers in Texas? When you build strong labor movements, it has an impact on the political realm. This has been shown time and time again. What further evidence does organized labor need of this? I mean, what, what else has to be done or said? Um, finally, we need a national left organization that is rooted among the oppressed, that is committed to ultimately a fundamental social transformation of the United States, but a movement that becomes a, an organization that helps to become the conscience of the broader progressive forces that is situated and is determined to bring about the kind of popular front that's needed, the popular unity that's needed in order to crush the right-wing populace and force the centrists within the Democratic Party ultimately off the stage. We have the opportunities now. And the one thing we have to keep in mind is that history doesn't give us many second chances. You blow the opportunity and you often blow it for decades to come. We can't afford it because the future of this planet is literally at stake. Thank you very much. Bill, we have a number of questions about, you know, strategy, uh, obviously, and in terms of the right-wing populism and how do we actually build this front? You talked about um, uh, the labor movement and how important the labor movement is this country to fighting against the right-wing populism. So John Martinez has a question about, is right-wing populism anti-union? Uh, what are the um, other, what are the examples of what the labor movement did in some of those uh, states? And what more can you tell, um, tell us in terms of uh, particular strategies and work that the labor movement should be doing to turn the Okay, thank you. Um, so it, this question of, is right-wing populism anti-union? Um, well, that's an interesting question, John. It depends on how you define anti-union. Um, by which I mean this, and I'm not trying to be funny. Um, the KKK uh, would have active union members that would engage in strikes and other kinds of actions. Was the KKK anti-union? Absolutely. Why? Because they didn't believe in true solidarity. And so right-wing populism is fundamentally anti-union, even though there are union members who would very much fit the bill in terms of being a right-wing populist. Because at the end of the day, they're not, you know, the, the, um, 
A. Philip Randolph said, the essence of trade unionism is social uplift. Right-wing populism is not in favor of social uplift. It's in favor of the uplift of certain groups. And so as such, it, it is anti-union. And it is an incredible danger within our ranks because there are union members and in fact some union leaders that, in, that do embrace right-wing populism and they can sound progressive until you push them. Um, in terms of examples, the, um, well, I use the example of Unite Here um, because I, I thought that they represented among the best in terms of the deployment and despite all of the hardship that Unite Here is facing. Uh, at one point, 95% of their membership was uh, unemployed. Now I think it's about 85%. And it is as suffered probably greater than most other unions in the country. That said, they devoted resources and the work of their members in state after state, particularly in Nevada and in, in Florida. Um, but I think also in Arizona was very, very important. So, so uh, there were other organizations that uh, devoted an immense amount of activity uh, and, and resources. SEIU was another, I know that AFSCME uh, was very involved. But what I think we have to look at is deeper than this. Um, I mentioned before other forms of organization. We have to be making a longer term commitment to electoral organization. And the involvement of most unions is limited to the electoral cycle. So for example, in, the, in Virginia, this group I mentioned, New Virginia Majority, started a number of years ago. Some progressives put it together with the idea of building a statewide progressive electoral organization. It's a 501c4, which is a tax designation. And it is not a political party. It's not set itself up as in opposition to the Democrats. And it has raised issues and it has support can, supported candidacies and has built, basically built up significant base areas in different parts of the state. Now, I think about, and, and they've received some support from some unions, um, you know, like, uh, like SEIU. But I think about what the unions could do if they started uh, at, the, at the central labor council level and at the state level, state uh, federation level, if they started creating ongoing standing organizations of union members to engage in a political action. Uh, not simply get out the vote activists, but people that were uh, carrying out political education during the year, uh, that were getting involved in legislative work on an ongoing basis, union members and their families. And I emphasize and their families because, it's, because one of the best ways to ensure that you have the union members themselves involved is if you open up and you say, no, this is, not a, this is not a closed club. This is something that you and your families can participate in. Uh, and, and this is something I've been pushing for a number of years. And there's great resistance for reasons I've never been able to understand uh, within the union movement, unless it's simply fear of loss of control. So there's been a number of things that have been happening. Uh, and I think in the lead up to the midterm elections, we're going to have to go further. Okay. There's some other questions here around um, expanding the popular front. And um, one of them is given the, um, uh, the building of the Black Lives Matter movement, how do you see that um, intersecting with uh, building that broad popular front that, uh, around the right wing populism? That's a really interesting question. Um, the, uh, the one thing about building any kind of united front uh, is summed up in the slogan, the stronger the core, the broader the front. When you have a weak core, you have a weak front, very fragile. 
And, and so part of what I would say is that progressives can't afford to be wobbly. We have to have things that we stand for and that we're fighting for. That includes a lot of the work that the Movement for Black Lives, um, immigrant rights organizations, and a number of uh, environmental justice groups that have been at the forefront of these battles for democracy. Um, they are at the core of that broader front. And what we have to understand though, is that if you want to win, you have to have a broad front. You have to have allies. It's not enough to have a strong core. A strong core in the absence of, of allies is a sect and sometimes a cult. A, uh, a strong core that is interested in winning is always is preoccupied with how to increase the, its expanse and building up the, uh, the, the breadth of the front in offering opportunities for more and more forces to come in. Now, some of that may be tactical. That is very particular battles. Like in this particular election, there are people that were prepared to vote for Biden despite disagreeing with Democrats and certainly disagreeing with progressives on a whole host of things because they disagreed with Trump and thought he was an idiot. Now, do we reject them because they don't go along with the whole program? That would be suicidal. But, it, but we do understand that there's limits to their involvement. So we've got to be doing, we've got to be walking on two legs. And that's where groups like the Movement for Black Lives, which itself is a coalition, uh, groups, uh, uh, and the immigrant rights movement, environmental justice, uh, forces among the, the progressive segment of the labor movement, all need to be part of that core. That's the balancing act that we're working. One of the groups that uh, Romy, had, Romy Garcia has raised is the uh, Poor People's Campaign uh, that uh, identifies the three evils of systemic racism, poverty, and militarism, uh, and that this effort has been revived, adding environmental, environmental devastation to these evils. Wants to know your thought of the progressive movement endorsing and helping to coalesce the Poor People's Campaign. Um, no, absolutely. I think that uh, it's, a, it's a critically important movement. Um, there is, and, and, and it's part of the broad front. Um, the, but it's not the broad front by itself. So what we have to be careful about is asking people to join one particular formation as opposed to saying we need to coalesce uh, these different efforts, coalesce the poor people's campaign with the environmental justice movement, with uh, segments of organized labor, et cetera, that this is the makings of a new kind of popular unity. Uh, so that, that's one of the things that I would say. The other thing, which is a little bit controversial, is that there really is a debate of the extent to which poor people identify as poor people. And, and I, I think that this is really complicated, that, um, that the objectives of the poor people's campaign, I, I have no question about, um, and I stand by. But we, we live in a strange country where people often don't want to identify as to what they actually are. And so there's an immense amount of consciousness raising, which is to, tied to building a greater understanding of class that I think is, is critical if we are to win. Uh, class, not in um, a narrow sense, um, but class in the sense of who is it that actually has to sell their labor power in order to live? And even if they happen right now not to be working, and even if they are working in very poor jobs or not so poor jobs, right? How, and it's like really rehabilitating class and class struggle. 
And, and that needs to be part of this coalition that we're building. Now, it doesn't mean that the whole front is going gonna, is gonna to get it. But we at the core absolutely have to. We can't walk away from this issue of class. And I think that the Poor People's Campaign contributes towards a better understanding of class, certainly than most of the labor movement, which keeps talking about this thing that I, I, I hear exists somewhere called the middle class. Yes. Um, there, there's another question here in terms of, uh, I would assume, the core. What should our relationship be with uh, DSA and other socialist formations? Um, well, it sort of depends on who you mean, us, to borrow from the immortal uh, philosopher Tanto. Um, who is we? Uh, so I would say that those of us that self-identify with the left need to be thinking about building a large, effective, left-wing organization at the national level that is rooted among oppressed people. Um, it cannot be mainly something that's rooted in academia. Um, it, it has to be rooted among uh, the poor. Um, it needs to be rooted among the marginalized. Uh, that, that, I think, is our central work. I think that DSA has a very, very important role to play in that. Um, and I think that it, uh, the role that it, it has to play uh, will only happen if it understands that it can't simply absorb everybody, that it needs to be part of building something bigger, more expansive, and more diverse. See, I mean, if you, if you approach things in the sense of people should join us, that raises certain concerns. Um, and on the other hand, if you say, let us come together, um, I, I'm very much affected, uh, and I, I think I spoke to this once when I was in Seattle, by the, the legacy of Tecumseh, the Shawnee leader in the, leader in the first decade of the 19th century. And one of the things that he recognized was that no individual tribe among the First Nations was going to be able to defeat the white settlers. No loose assortment was going to be able to. That a different form of organization was going to be necessary. And he went about weaving together a confederation that could ultimately have become an Indian nation state. Unfortunately, it didn't succeed. But his objective was absolutely correct. Now, Tecumseh did not go around saying, everybody should join with the Shawnee. Right? He went around saying, how do our tribes come together? And what's it going to take? And he set up a base area near a river called Tippecanoe. And that was to be the base area for the establishment of this confederation. I think that there's a lot to learn from Tecumseh. Um, there's, there's some questions here about um, those that are part of this right-wing populist movement. Um, how do we talk to them? Do we try to win them over? Um, or should, I mean, do we both focus on building a popular front as well as trying to win over those people in the right-wing populist movement? Okay, so I'm going to say something that will probably piss some people off. But since we're <laughs> 3,000 miles away at least, I can afford to do it. Um, <laughs> If you look at elections, one of the things that becomes apparent is that somewhere around 25% of the electorate is thoroughly reactionary. I call them zombies. Uh, they're people that have lost their humanity. Uh, they've lost their empathy. They um, uh, include fascists, but are not limited to fascists. These are people that consistently vote in a reactionary way. These are people that can't be won back. Now, the, so the good news is that maybe 75% of the country is in touch with reality for the most part. Although, as we saw in this election, 
eh, you know, some people are like floating a little bit out there. So I, I say on an optimistic level that I think that uh, at least 75% can be worked with. But I don't start there. I start with solidifying the people who have not rejected reality. So I, I start with the 77 million people, and, and plus the people that chose not to vote in this election. Um, that's who I would concentrate on. And the reason I say that is, you know, I, I had what I call the zombie test before the, um, the election. I didn't patent it, so uh, you can feel free to use this. Um, the zombie test was three questions. And it was, and anytime you weren't sure whether someone was a zombie, you'd ask them the following. One, what did you make of Trump disparaging U.S. veterans and deceased servicemen and women? That's question one. Question two, what did you make of Trump lying to the public about the COVID-19 pandemic, as demonstrated by his own words, as, uh, as, as caught on tape. And question three, what do you make of the fact that this guy has, is in debt to possibly $400 million? We have no idea to whom he's in debt, and he won't reveal his tax returns. Now, Depending on how someone responds to those questions, you really know whether they're a zombie. Um, because just think about it for a second. All of these so-called patriots, how can they excuse disparaging veterans and deceased service men and women? I mean, how, how do you do that? How do you live with yourself? Well, you do if you've lost your humanity or you've lost your mind. And so I think, I, I think it's important for us to use the zombie test. And depending on how someone rates on the zombie test, you know whether it's worth the time having any further discussions with them, at least right now. Now, when we're stronger, maybe you go back to them. Or when their paradigm collapses, you go back to them. Um, I don't know, you know, it's like in the 2016 election, I read a, a letter that was written by a teamster to the leadership of his union, where he basically said he was going to vote for Trump because he was voting for the future of his son. And my reaction to that was, oh, okay, sucker, so you're going to vote for the future of your son on my back. Right? That's what you're telling me. And I'm supposed to say, that's okay, I understand. Well, I don't understand, and it's not okay. So I, I don't think that those are not the target population, Cindy. Yes. And I think we, we have to be careful about this, because we can't spend a lot of time with people out of touch with reality. We, just, we can't afford to. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, and you put that out before. Um, I personally agree with you. So, <laughs> um, thank you. There's a there's a there's a question here about the media reports that Trump does better on the issues of the economy. How do we flip the narrative so that every day Americans see that progressive policies like family leave, universal health care, a just climate transition, fifteen dollar minimum wage are good for working people and the economy? Why is it so hard to shift this narrative? Excellent question. So I think there's a few things. One is that most people have not a clue about how the economy works. Let's just be real. And we often, we're trained to think that the economy equals Wall Street. And so if the stock market's going up, the economy must be good. If it's going down, it must be bad. So that's the way we're trained. Uh, we opt, we're obviously not trained in anything about surplus value or wage labor or anything else like that. So one thing that we're dealing with is a lack of economic education at the base. People understand the way that the economy is affecting them, but they don't understand the economy. 
I know that sounds like a paradox. So they understand that they're poor. They don't like it. Um, they hope to get out of it, but they don't necessarily translate that. A second thing is that what Trump was, uh, Trump got high marks on the economy in part because he inherited a good economy. I remember right before 2016, economists were writing, and you can check this yourselves, that no matter who won the election, they were gonna inherit a good economy. And so what Trump did is just that. And then with his tax giveaway in 2017, that was a temporary blip uh, on, uh, with the economy. But there were signs by late 2019 that the economy might be moving into a downturn. We don't know what would have happened had there been no pandemic. But there were signs that it was moving at least into a, a uh, the cycle, uh, uh, the, down, the downside of the cycle. Um, so that's a second thing. A third thing is that in this country, we mythologize business people. And what Trump has been very successful at doing, and New York Times really nailed this, is that Trump has been very good as a snake oil salesman. He's been basically uh, been able to use uh, PR propaganda in order to build his brand, regardless of the numerous bankruptcies that he found himself in. But he was, a, he was able to walk away and promote the idea that he was a shrewd businessman. And many people in this country really love that idea. And this is also related to another thing that has to do with the absence of class consciousness in this country, where many people want to be rich. And they not only want to be rich, they believe ultimately they will be. This is particularly true among white people. And, and it's one of these things that uh, surfaces when you have tax reform efforts that often get shot down by the very people who would benefit from them. And when they are asked, why did you vote against this? They'd say, well, I, I might be rich at some point too. And it's like, oh my God, right? <clears throat> I mean, what are you talking about? So all of these factors contribute. The issue of economic education is why back in the 1990s, when I was at the AFL-CIO, uh, we did this common sense economics program to talk with the workers and uh, the members of the unions first and then workers more generally about capitalism. And it was one of the best things that we could have done. And it was, it was insane that the union movement stopped doing it. And then when they picked it up again uh, after 2009, it was sort of a shadow of itself. The, the movement, the union movement by uh, overall has paid precious little attention to talking about the economic system. And part of that is related to anti-communism. You still have within our movement an immense fear of talking about how atrocious the capitalist system is for fear that people would be attacked as communists. So you end up caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. The economy is crushing our base, crushing workers, but you've got leaders that are afraid, wow, if we really talk about what's going on, someone's going to red bait me. And, you know, this is, this is understandable. And uh, the, I mean, you can see what happened in the election when Trump, in fact, did red bait and other Republicans did red bait. Um, we just have to be ready to fight back. Tell them to go to hell. Yes. Um, people liked your, uh, the, uh, what did you call it? The uh, test. The, the oh, the zombie questions. test. Yes, the zombie questions, and they want you to repeat the zombie questions because okay, they want sure. to go through their, their list of people. <laughs> very good, very good. Now, I want credit for that. I'm not asking for any royalties, <laughs> but, but credit would be very helpful. So the zombie test are three questions. Now, you can feel free to add your own, <laughs> right? The first question is, um, how did you respond uh, or what did you say when you found out that Trump had disparaged U.S. veterans and deceased servicemen and women? Uh, the second is, how did you respond or what did you say 
when you found out that Trump lied about the COVID pandemic, knowing full well the extent of it. How did you respond and what did you say when you found out that Trump is in debt to approximately at, at least $400 million to sources unknown and will not reveal his tax returns? Uh, another good one that was just added here. What did you make of Trump mocking a person with a disability? I, uh, I thank you very much. Let's add that on. So that's number four. Uh, so feel free to add them on. See, the thing is, in, in, in all seriousness, use this. It will be it will be part of a teachable moment. How how does somebody? I grew up with this guy named Christopher. One of the nicest people I'd ever known, very sheltered, um, very strict parents, and went to Vietnam and never came back. When Trump disparaged these veterans, he's talking about Christopher. He's saying Christopher was a sucker, was a loser. Who the hell does Trump think he is? And who the hell does someone who will otherwise wave the flag, call Obama a terrorist, whatever, and sit back and justify disparaging the veterans and the dead servicemen and women? As far as I'm concerned, they can go to hell. I am not interested in talking to them. There is not one damn thing they could say to me that I'm interested in hearing. There's not one damn excuse they could give. There's not one explanation they could give. They can go to hell and roast as far as I'm concerned. So you can feel free to use the zombie test. I'm telling you, it will, it will help, it will help crystallize what's at stake. Right. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, close with this one last question. Uh, what should we be doing in the next few weeks? Um, well, just in general, given the situation that, that Trump is stating. Um, we need to do several things. So, um, and this is not in order of importance. So one thing is we need to have echo chambers all around the country, echo chambers meaning we need to be repeating in different media key messages. And the, and the central one is Biden won the damn election. It is over. Trump out. Get the hell out. Right? That's the message. Right? And so it's, we're past count the vote. It is get the hell out go into retirement, go to Florida, or go to Brazil where there's no extradition, right? Just get out. So that's one thing that we have to do. We have to have, because what, what's happening on the other side is that they're continuing to repeat this nonsense. Second thing, we need to um, show up when there's demonstrations. When the right wing demonstrates, we got to be there. We need to outnumber them. Uh, when there's any uh, hearings that come up, if there's any further recounts, we need to have a presence. So one of the things is outnumber. But in outnumbering, one of the critical things is don't allow yourself to be provoked. Be very careful, because as we saw in the post-George Floyd protests, there are provocateurs out there that are trying to disparage the movement. So we have to be very, very careful. So that's another thing we have to do. Um, we need to be building a, a, a presence and making our voices known to the incoming Biden-Harris administration about everything from cabinet posts to their agenda. For example, I think that what's critical is Green New Deal, um, a democratic foreign policy with a small d, democratic, and um, uh, uh, voting rights. 
And not that other things aren't important, but we've got to hammer, the administration's got to hammer away. It needs to reverse all of those idiotic um, uh, executive orders that Trump did. But we need a Green New Deal agenda out there. We need something that's about economic development in the context of saving the planet. We need a democratic foreign policy, which includes U.S. hands off of Latin America. Stop mucking around with Latin America. It includes uh, rejoining the Paris uh, uh, Agreement, rejoining the Iran nuclear agreement, um, disengage from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and allow others to serve as the honest brokers. The United States does not have the capability to be an honest broker between the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Palestinians are always on the losing end. Uh, uh, whenever the United States is involved, disengage. The United States, uh, we also have to have a disengagement or a de-escalation of the conflict with China. Even if you want to say that there's economic competition, which I would say only goes but so far since you've got these transnational corporations that are in all these countries, um, the military and disengagement is critical. Um, the U.S. needs to stop backing tyrants like Duterte in the Philippines, like Putin in Russia, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then voting rights. We need to have a movement for one person, one vote in this country. We need to ultimately get rid of the Electoral College, even if it's done in stages. We've got to take steps against any and all forms of voter suppression. So those are some of the platform things I would argue we got to push the Biden-Harris administration on. I'm sure there's others, and I, I respect that. But then organizationally. I remember in 2017, Cindy, when we had a discussion about the need for building organization, I would say uh, we need more organizations like New Virginia Majority, New Florida Majority. We need, uh, they can be coalitions or they can be independent standalone organizations, but we've got to have real mass bases, real platforms, and real work. And we've got to get into parts of different states where we are not located building base areas around the states. So those are some of the things that I, I think need that. to happen. Could you try again? <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> it was one of your zombies. <laughs> yeah, really. Either that or the NSA checking in. Yes. <laughs> I think it's my, my bed check from the NSA. <laughs> well, thank you, Bill. You've given us a sure. lot to think about, and I hope people will go on organizing upgrade to read Bill's article on post-election reckoning that he wrote with Carl Davidson. And uh, check out his books, uh, especially his latest fiction book. And I want to thank you, and I hope we can have an opportunity again to speak about uh, what's, what's going on and building this pop broad popular front. And I want to thank the co-sponsoring co organizations uh, for coming together tonight to have this discussion. So thanks, and good thank night. You. Thank All you, right. and thank you to everyone.